Hello everybody, welcome back to another video. Sorry I haven't been posting much recently. I've been under the weather with a cold and the flu and God knows what else. Um, but we're back today and we're back to one of the stalwart cameras from the 35mm SLR range. As you know, these are my sort of favourite cameras. Well, they're all my favourite cameras to be honest. I don't really have any cameras I don't like. Um, but the 35mm SLRs are probably the most flexible. And today, of course, we're looking at this uh, iconic camera, the Nikon or Nikon F3, introduced in 1980. This is when technology started to really have an impact in the world of photography. And, uh, yeah, this was the third generation of the, uh, the Nikon F cameras. We had the F in 59, the F2 in 72, and then we got this in 1980. Designed by the Italian guy whose name I can't pronounce, um, probably more famous for designing cars than cameras, but uh, this was the introduction of the red stripe that we see on so many Nikons um, from this sort of period onwards really, um, even my sort of D3 and my D7000, they've got these sort of red stripes on them. So, uh, right, let's start with a bit of an overview. They use AI lenses. Um, AI was introduced in 77. This is this automatic indexing feature of the lens. Um, to remove the lens, you push on this big button down here, twist it in the clockwise direction, and off it comes. So here we can see quite a big lens throat, and this is the AI coupler here. And on these cameras, they were um, backwards compatible. You can flick them out of the way, so you can mount pre-AI lenses on here, but with stop-down metering because this thing here transfers the set aperture to the camera's metering system. Two versions I've got here. This one's an HP, which is a high eye point viewfinder. The uh, standard viewfinder that it was introduced with was this one. I thought I turned that off. Um, yeah, this was a standard viewfinder that it was introduced with. This one came a little bit later. Of all of the F series, I think this one had the most variations. Um, there was a pellicle mirrored version, um, which is a, a fixed mirror that doesn't move, that ran about 13, 14 frames a second. So a 36 exposure film wouldn't last very long. Full system camera, so this one's wearing the MD4 motor drive. This runs at uh, 4 frames a second, or 6 frames a second with the mirror locked up. Um, there was also titanium versions, there was also pressed versions, which had better weather sealing. And there was an extremely rare autofocus version which only had two lenses um, that went with it. And the lenses, interestingly enough, had the, um, the autofocus motor, motor built into the lens. Um, even though Nikon went the other way and went for the screw drive originally down at the bottom here when they sort of really got into AF. But let's give you a quick overview of the camera. So, like I showed you before, lens release button, you can see it's just a little pin that locks there. PC uh, port at the top, nice straps, uh, lugs here. Electronic shutter, stepless, but there is a mechanical speed on it. If I, oh, this one is round on this little button down here, if you fold it out to the side, that gives you a mechanical speed, which I think is an 80th. That is the only mechanical speed that you have. Push the button in the middle, that is uh, exposure memory, exposure lock. Um, if you push this one in, it is depth of field preview. If you can see that the lighting isn't particularly good, but you can see the aperture activating lever moving. If you push it in and hold and then turn that, that gives you the mirror up. So, yep, very well specified. This is the, uh, the self-timer flashing LED. On the top plate we have self-resetting film counter, uh, wind-on lever, the um, shutter release button, which is electronic rather than mechanical. I struggled with these when they first came out. I did buy one of these in 1980 and I sold it a week later because I couldn't get on with the shutter button. I was using F2s at the time. And I much preferred the F2 over this. But it's something you kind of grow into. Multiple exposure. Flip this forward. And it will recock the shutter, but it won't advance the film. Um, shutter speed selector. 
it is lockable a is for automatic and we have shutter speeds from two thousandth of a second all the way down to eight seconds plus b t and an x setting as well and surrounding this we have the self timer activation so you push that that way and this one on this side is the meter you can leave them turned on to be honest because the meter activates when you initially push down on the button here so this is wound on so i'll push this now you can see the self timer led flashing and i think it's about 10 to 12 seconds it's the standard sort of time but yeah it goes a bit crazy, crazy as it gets near the end so that's your self timer and uh, on the other side we have exposure compensation plus or minus two stops again that's got a little lock on it everything seems to have a little lock on it because it's a professional camera um, this is where you set your ASA or your ISO and it's got quite a wide ISO range these it goes from pull up and turn so this goes up to 6400 which is quite high even by today's standards all the way down to 12 so the film we're going to be loading today is actually 400 400 on there rewind crank for manually rewinding the film it is a pull up type but again there's a lock on it so you turn push this to the right and then this will come up Pull it up to open the back film reminder tab this is a standard back there are interchangeable backs there's a 250 back and there's also a special back that leaves the leader of the film out if you use the motor drive because the motor drive does rewind the film as well multi sprocket take up spool sprocket drive film plane horizontal traveling shutter so that's why it's got quite a low flash sync speed of an 80th of a second uh, it doesn't have a metal, a metal vertical travelling shutter, it has a silk cloth horizontal shutter. This is where your film goes. It also has a blind for the, the eyepiece. And to remove the finder, because all these F-series have interchangeable finders, you can see there's a catch here, and a corresponding catch on the other side. If you lift those backwards and the prism will just uh, come off the only difference between a HP and an H is this finder uh, both the same interchangeable screens quite a large number of them but they are really for specialist applications it reads in the viewfinder it will show you the aperture and the shutter speed if you're in manual mode if you're in automatic mode it will tell you the shutter speed that it's selected to go with the aperture that you've previously chosen uh, for the time very advanced feature has a little lcd display i don't know whether this is going to focus on it yes it is you can see this is in manual mode and uh, it is saying an 80th of a second there is a backlight illuminator but that rarely works on these and even when it does it's not very good come on focus push down on that again but yeah there's a little red button here that you can push it should give you some illumination but it very rarely works oh blimey there you go this one does work you can see at the best of times it's not exactly it's like someone's got a candle behind there but yeah it reads the uh, the aperture scales we've seen previously on ai and ais lenses remember ais lenses have the uh, the orange writing let me just turn some light on the weather's changed I thought it was a sunny day I'll make a video but yeah the lighting's changed you can see this second set of um, f numbers at the bottom here AIS lenses the last ones are orange this is a, an E series 50mm which is supposedly the best 50mm it's not a great example it's quite loose on the focus but uh, yeah sharp lens right that goes back on to put it back on you just put it on and push firmly and push back on the catches which will make it a little bit easier that's back on to mount a lens Nikon lenses 
I've got a reference mark, this flat mark here. You just have to line that up and twist. Put the AI catch back down. So that is the basics of the camera overall. Because it has the AI coupling, this is a AF nickel, which is an autofocus lens, but it does have the AI coupling ring. As you can see there as I turn the aperture, it tells the camera what the aperture is. No autofocus with this, you have to focus manually, but other than that, the lens works fine. Center weighted metering, we didn't have um, 3D color matrix metering on these, it's just the normal center weighted metering. The one downside I see with these is that when you put the motor drive on, it does cover the, um, the self timer LED. But yeah, this one's fitted with the MD4. Really heavy. It's uh, another one of those cameras that you could use as a weapon. This one has been dropped. It's one of them that's been dropped. Yeah, this one you can see it's been dropped. Um, they will take a lot of abuse. And uh, yeah, this one has the optional motor drive. I think we have got some power in this. On the motor drive on the top, you have lock, single, and continuous. And you have another shutter button on the top here. So. And it winds the film on as you taking the picture. There's no film in this camera. And I'm continuous, this is mirrored down. And then, like I said, you can lock the mirror up. That gives you the fastest rate. No, nope. because it's an automatic. I think the metering's built into the prism, actually. So. There you go, six frames a second, so six seconds and that's your roll of film gone. Uh, useful for press photographers, that's pretty much designed for sports, action, wildlife, that kind of thing. That's what it's designed for. These um, run on eight uh, AA batteries, that's 12 volts. There is a, an ICAD battery pack that goes in there, but most of those have long since died. This has got eight cells in it. Um, little button here to push for the battery check. I'll try not cover the LEDs. Two LEDs. When it gets to the end of the film, this LED will light up and tell you. There is a counter on the back. This, in normal use, you don't actually have to use. You can uh, adjust it to the orange setting. That is the way you would normally use it, is with it on the orange setting. If you want to shoot a set of frames, if you wanted to shoot, say, 10 frames, you can set this to 10. And then once it gets to zero, it will stop. Um, it's designed really for use in cold weather when film gets brittle. The idea is just to stop it from uh, ripping the film apart when the film gets brittle. But in normal climates, even this horrible cold, wet English one, um, just leave it on the orange setting. To rewind the film, you push in this button here, move it over, and then you push this button up. Starts to rewind. No film in the camera, but it doesn't know that. And then it'll stop when it gets to the end of the film. On the underside, the bit that we haven't looked at, you can see here is the rewind hole. Here's where the batteries go two SR44s. Again, don't use LR44s, they've not got the bump in them. That's the advance, that's for manual rewind. Obviously there's some connections. Um, underneath here there's a load of electrical connections. This is it. Uh, this is the drive itself. So you can see all the electrical connections that are around there. Um, you've got a power input and also for invalometers and timers and all sorts of specialist equipment. There's another port on that side. And you can see on here, this is the, uh, the advanced part. This is the... Uh, the rewind part and when you do when you when you push those together you can see that pops up and rewinds the film so quite handy having a power rewind um, I'm not sure if this one works or not but I don't need two of them with motor drives on the camera without the motor drive is heavy enough with the motor drive it's about twice the weight when it's got batteries in it but, uh, yeah, very solid, made of metal, metal top plate, metal bottom plate. 
um, a brilliant camera. Let me try and load it uh, with some film. So if you remember, you push this catch across, lift it up, and the back swings open quite violently. I've got a roll of this uh, Kentmere Ilford made, or Harman made, Pan 400. So that just goes into there, held in place by the catch. Um, you can manually advance the, uh, the film um, without uh, using the motor drive. And the other interesting thing is the shutter button with the motor drive attached. I'll put this back onto single. When you push it down, it will take the picture, but it won't wind on until you release the shutter. So, for example, with weddings and things or places where you want to be a little bit more discreet, um, although SLRs are never really discreet, to be honest, but uh, multi-slotted take-up spool, so you just have to feed the end into there and uh, advance the film. Oh, he says... There we go. So you can see that that's all lined up quite nicely. As usual with me, I like to rewind the film, take the slack out of it, and also I know when the film's being advanced. And uh, close the back up. And then I've already set the ASA, so you see the light flashes just to show that it is working. So you can't hear it. And that's taken us through to the first exposure. Um, I will show you this that if you push for this button. Now, oh, we've got a red light. It's low batteries, isn't it? I think with these. It's a bit strange. Uh, <laughs> I only put this set of batteries in it yesterday. <clears throat> or is it because this thing isn't set on the orange? It's on zero, that's why. It's counted down to zero on that counter. Um, so when it's down to zero, it then... Uh... Oh, I've got no nails. So we've got to turn this. You can set this for 12, 24 and 36, which used to be the old film sizes. I don't think anybody's making 12s now, apart from the ones that you roll yourself. It on the orange counter so when you push it down the shutter fires then it winds on shutter fires then it winds on so there's a very brief overview of the f3 highly recommended as all my cameras always seem to be um, it's a true trojan workhorse was built and survived right the way through the autofocus period actually it uh, was still in production when the uh, f4 came out in 88 even when the F5 came out in 96, it was still in production. It didn't go out of production until about 2001. So it had like a very long lifespan. It was a very popular camera, totally reliable, well proven, not that expensive to buy nowadays, and particularly motor drives. They're very, very cheap nowadays. People don't really have any desire for them. Of course, it's all built in now, so you don't have this great big chunk, almost the same size as the camera hanging underneath. Like I said, really heavy, and this is with a lightweight plastic lens on it. If you put a Telephoto like a 300-2.8 on there, it would be back-breaking. Um, fair play to the guys who lug two of these around all day long. Um, I'm not sure many people do it nowadays. Then having said that, the new cameras aren't an awful lot lighter. Aperture priority, very nice. Just set your aperture. Shows you the aperture and the shutter speed in the finder. Compensation on this side. What more do you need? Thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed. Comment, queries, questions down below. Anything that I've missed. Um, I hope I haven't missed anything too important. And uh, yeah, these won't work with G series lenses. They do need an aperture ring. So any of the newer lenses that uh, don't have an aperture ring, what commonly referred to as gelded lenses, G series lenses. Um, won't work with it and there's no way up. it's the last of the manual focus F series I've already shown you the F2 and the F in earlier videos so if you're interested in these cameras have a, have a check out of those videos but yep thank you very much for watching hope you enjoyed 
comments, questions, queries, like, share, subscribe, all that usual sort of stuff. And uh, yeah, I aim to try and get back to making more of these videos. That's awkward the way that's in there. Let's get the mirror back down again. Yeah, very specialist camera. The specialist finders, these are the most common two. Probably the waist level finder would be the next one, but uh, the waist level finder on 35mm I don't find particularly useful. It's a bit too small for that. I love it on um, two and a quarter or larger, but uh, on 35mm waist level finder is a bit specialist. Same as the six times uh, viewfinder, it's can't really see it. Happiest really with the HP because I wear glasses. Um, but yeah, there's no functional difference between these two. It's just this is a high eye point. You can uh, view the image from slightly further away. It makes it easier to use. Right, that's enough of me waffling on for today. Thank you very much. And once again, congratulations to Martin. Um, I'm just in the process of organising um, the delivery of his film to him. He's going to uh, send us some sample shots and some pics of the happy winner, etc. And uh, yeah, look forward to seeing you in the next one.